Thank you for joining us. Here at BLC, our purpose is helping people discover and develop a life in Christ. Hey, listen, I'm going to get right into it because I have a lot of uh, notes. Uh, and this has been a message that the Lord has been brewing on my heart for probably two months or so. And um, I'm going to be talking about the fear of the Lord. And I think we've been in church for some time. Any length of time, you've probably heard the term fear of the Lord. If you ever picked up your Bible and read it once, you, you probably have read fear of the Lord. And so we read it in scriptures, we sing it in songs, and, I, and that's what happened to me. I was singing it one day, and then I was like, what? The fear of the Lord? And I think it's one of those churchy terms that we just see and we think nothing more of it. We just kind of browse on past it in the word or in the, in the songs. And I had the hardest time with that when I was singing it because I'm like, because of what Jesus did on the cross... I don't fear him. And so it really had me to try and dive into this because he forgave our sins. He made it possible that we will spend eternity in heaven. He died on the cross so that we will live with him forever. Is that a laundry list of someone that I should be afraid of or have fear for? I should be thankful. I should be joyful. I think we have a lot of those feelings and we don't understand what this term fear really means. And we're going to break that down. And so I was asking the Lord, I'm like, because I'm seeing this term fear the Lord, and I'm like, what am I missing? Because it's not the word. The word's not messed up. It's my understanding, my revelation, my interpretation. That's messed up. And so I needed help with that. So you go to the Lord and say, what, what is this all about? Because I don't fear God in the term that I understand fear, right? I love God. I respect God. I'm thankful to God. The list just keeps on going, right? Because the many things that he's done for us. But fear, I couldn't say that I truly had those feelings towards him. He's a good God. He is love. I'm asking myself, how could I fear him? Do any of you all struggle with that? You ever think about that? And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to break it down. And so in my search, and so I'm just, I'm reading. And that's the, that's the hard part, right? When you go outside the word, you get a lot of opinion. And you got to kind of sift through the opinions to get to where truth may lie, right? Because there are some good things out there, but there are some really just not so good. And in that, one of the things I heard is that the fear of the Lord is Old Testament. We're under a new grace because of what Jesus did on the cross. And they use examples like 2 Timothy 1.7 where it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Y'all probably have that like memorized, written down. It's on the refrigerator. It might be like my wife where she has it plastered everywhere, right? And we quote that, right? Because if anything comes in our life, we, we quote 2 Timothy a whole lot. And so somewhat, people were using that to say, well, he hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And so that's Old Testament. You know, fear of the Lord isn't for New Testament anymore. And so I just had to ponder this. And I was looking at 2 Timothy and I said, well, if God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but then I'm supposed to have fear of the Lord, which one is it, to fear or to not fear? So you kind of see my dilemma and my inner workings here, all right? And people do make a convincing argument about it. But here's the thing. Scripture must back, be backed up by other scripture. It, 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 there's no conflict between scripture. I'm not saying one scripture is right and one's wrong. There is no conflict between scripture. The reason I'm saying scripture must back up scripture is because if we can't back it up with other scripture, that means the way we're interpreting it, the way we're reading it, the way we're understanding it, it's not right. The conflict is with us, with our reading, with how we're looking at things. And so oftentimes, I think we take scripture out of context of what the intended message was. You have to think about who is being talked to. A lot of times we like to take one verse and we don't like to go up or down. Sometimes when you read the next verse, you kind of go, oh, that's what he's talking about. And so let's do that. 
So it's 2 Timothy 1.8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his. Huh. Prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel. Sorry, I had to catch my breath there. So Paul here is telling Timothy in verse 7, don't be fearful. You have been given power, love, and a sound mind. And why do we feel ashamed sometimes is pressure putting on... The Lord doesn't make us feel ashamed. Shame does not come from him. Conviction will. Condemnation is not. There are two different things. And so shame does not come from the Lord. And so what, what Paul is telling Timothy here is that that shame you're feeling, that's not from the Lord. That's coming from a different place. So do not stop what you're doing. Keep preaching the gospel. And a lot of times it's because um, we feel the shame because typically when we're not doing something right. But in this case, Timothy is doing what's right. He's sharing the gospel. He's sharing the good news. But he isn't doing right by the religious world and political leaders. Do you all feel ashamed sometimes because of the pressures of the world? They come on us, the culture that tells us, well, you shouldn't be talking like that. Or, hey, separation of church and state, keep that away from this building. Paul's trying to encourage him, like, you keep on your mission... And don't be fearful of that. Do not be ashamed. Continue to go forth because you have been given power, love, and a sound mind. Does that make sense? Okay. Shame does not come from God. It's usually from ourselves. We are our worst own critics. I will tell you, normally when I get off the stage, I'm like, I should have done this. I should have said this. I should have not that. that, that. Should have, should have, should have. You got to stop all those should have's. And then sometimes a lot of this shame comes from others. They just give you that look. (laughs) Little baby Nolan loves my wife Amanda. And Haley, his mom, got to see the look that Nolan gives me. Just like, how did you pull her? (laughs) This little two-year-old, man, he's putting me to shame. I was, I felt judged. But the shame, it comes from others, it comes from ourselves, it doesn't come from God. And we have to understand that. And so you have to understand in the times that this was writing, a lot of people were being put in jail and they were being killed for sharing the gospel. That is a different level of stress than today. Today we feel like we're persecuted because someone wrote something not nice about us. They didn't like my post on social media you get my drift? That is completely different than being killed. Way different. But we want to put ourselves at that level. Now, other countries where this book is illegal, they are going through that persecution. They are going through those things. But you know what? I think there's a boldness sometimes that comes out of it because sometimes those are the boldest Christians ever. They're willing to lose their life to smuggle one page of this book and just read it. I, I, I read this thing about this, this lady in China. And she, she memorizes the Bible like crazy. And then she would swallow and eat them. Because that was the only way to hide them from the prison guards. So they would smuggle in a little piece of paper with the scripture on it. And then they would swallow and eat it after they memorized it. I have not had to swallow or eat any of my scriptures, y'all. We live a completely different life. And so I think sometimes this fear of the Lord, we kind of forget it because we don't have the same pressures that they were going through back then or in some other countries. And so the first thing I want to settle before I really jump into all this is the fear of the Lord is very much for us today, the New Testament believer, as it was for those before us. It is very much for today. God does not change. The covenant changed. And I think this is where we get lost a little bit. The covenant changed with what Jesus did on the cross, but God doesn't change. His agreement with us changed. His covenant, but God does not. And so we got to understand that piece of it. So we still need to fear the Lord, and we're going to break break fear down. So let's jump into Psalm 25, 14. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. I thought that one was really fitting because it's like the Lord is a friend to those who fear him. 
and he teaches them his covenant. Well, we're under a new covenant. I want to be taught. We need to learn from the Lord. We have to fear the Lord. Okay? He does not change, so he is still a friend to us and to those that fear him. He teaches us his covenant, and ever since Jesus went to the cross, that is the new covenant. That is the new agreement because of what Jesus did. Jesus paid the price. He fulfilled the law. Okay? Same God, new covenant, fear of the Lord is very much for today. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, and I'm going to pull some New Testament stuff because those that say the fear of the Lord isn't for today, I'm going to hit you where it says fear of the Lord is for today. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How are we supposed to do it? The fear of God, the fear of the Lord. And it says the fear of the Lord cleanses us from filthiness and perfecting holiness. It's almost like the more we fear the Lord, the more we start cleansing ourselves of all these things. We start removing them, right? Because we have a different walk and relationship with the Lord that he gets more of us. And we start to live up to the standard that is. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. How are we supposed to serve God? Reverence and godly fear. And so it really does beg the question, is all fear bad? I don't think so. I think this tells us here that if we fear the Lord, he is a friend to us, that we should serve God with reverence and godly fear. I think the other thing to notice here is that they separate the the word reverence and godly fear because I think sometimes people take it out and say, well, the fear of the Lord just means reverence. It's so much more than just that word reverence. And I think that's why the writer here separated the two reverence and godly fear but they they didn't just say fear they didn't say reverence and fear they said godly fear because there's a difference between godly fear and just fear okay and we're gonna i promise i'm gonna get there i got a lot to get through (laughs) but we have to have both of those we have to have reverence and godly fear to truly serve our lord otherwise we're just doing acts on his behalf Instead of acts to glorify him or works to praise him, to worship him. Psalm 19.9 tells us the fear of the Lord is clean. When I think of fear, do you think of clean? I usually don't. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The fear of the Lord is clean. The word tells us it is clean. So, If I am afraid of God, that is not from God. That is not true fear of the Lord because it is clean. Not all fear is clean, though. Just the fear of the Lord and holy fear. I think there are fears in us that we need to get rid of. And the only way to get rid of them is with this holy fear. The fear of the Lord. And so to really paint, and I'm a very visual person. I need like pop-up cards, coloring books, things like that to really make things visual. And so to help with this, I have a story that I want to share. And I read this in a book called The Awe of God from John Bevere. And it's about an evangelist named Jim Baker. Uh, Who knows Jim Baker? Who's heard of Jim Baker? I did not. And you'll hear why because of the time frame here. Uh, Jim Baker was popular in 74 to 87. Very popular on the CBN network. So for us young guys, that's the Christian Broadcast Network. Uh, And in particular, he was on the 700 Club. He left there, co-founded TBN, the Trinity Broadcast Network. So in his time, Jim Baker was the man. He was on TV. That's where you could turn, tune in and hear, hear some word. But then in 88, Jim was convicted of 24 counts of mail fraud, wire fraud, and conspiracy. 
All because he liked his secretary a little too much. (laughs) He paroled in 94. But what's pretty amazing is that while in jail, he just seeked God. And while he was in jail, he read a book by John Brevere, and he asked John to come and visit him. And what I thought was really interesting is they're having a conversation, but John asked Jim this question, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? Such a good question, because if you loved Jesus, you wouldn't have done that to your wife. If you've loved Jesus, you wouldn't have stole money from all these people and misused it. If you loved Jesus, why are you sitting in jail? And Jim's response angered John because he said, John, I love Jesus the entire time. I mean, talk about like a throat punch. I mean, I would have been angry. And so John is just, he's actually furious. He's trying to hold his anger back. And he says, what do you mean you didn't stop loving Jesus? You had to have to do all this. No one that loves Jesus in their right mind would do these things. So Jim finished his sentence He said, I loved Jesus the entire time, but I didn't fear God. Whew. I loved Jesus the entire time, but I didn't fear God. And what Jim said next shook John. My name's John, too, so it shook this John as well. But it's because it's so true. He said, there are millions of Americans just like me. They love Jesus, but they don't fear God. Mm. Listen, I know this isn't a hoop and hollering kind of talk. I know this is weighty, but I think we need it. I think to turn the course of this nation, the church has to stand up. But we can't just stand up on just loving Jesus. We need to stand up on loving Jesus and fearing God. We need it all. And so that's what's wrong, in my opinion, with the church today in America We love Jesus, but we don't fear the Lord. Because if we feared the Lord, we wouldn't live a different life on Saturday than we portray on a Sunday morning. Listen, there's a lot of empty seats. We're normally a lot fuller today. Well, what happened yesterday? The derby. What probably happened? A lot of derby parties. Y'all can fill in the blank at what happens at some of these parties. Too much now I'm not going to come but you see the difference of the life we live on a Saturday than the one we portray on a Sunday that is I love Jesus but I don't fear God because if we feared the Lord these truths that are found in our Bibles in our word they would shape our lives more than the culture and world around us you know the funniest thing about TV that I found is that the first season it's usually pretty mellow. And then the second season, they, they crank it up a little bit. And then by the third season, they, it's really, really turned on there. But what happens is, I fell in love with the characters. I really love the show. Now we start making concessions. And you, you see the dilemma here? Culture is shaping us instead of the church shaping culture. We got to stop dating Jesus, and we need to be committed to him every day of our life. So I really do hope today's talk helps with this, and hopefully for us, we get to see what it means when the word says the fear of the Lord. And please, by no means think that you're going to leave here today like a theologian, that you're going to have it all. I'm still just scratching the surface. But I hope that you leave here today with enough to start seeking for yourself to get into the word, to spend time with the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit for revelation to reveal these things to you and and to fully understand it. Because this is going to take work on all of our part to seek God and, in my opinion, change our view of him and change our relationship towards him. And like I just said earlier, we can't date Jesus just on Sundays. We're supposed to be his bride. Listen, I would be pretty upset if my wife only came and saw me for an hour every week. That ain't a wife. She's like, sounds good to me. (laughs) He drives me nuts. (laughs) 
Nolan be in there swooping in, taking her. <laughs> we have to be fully committed. And, and the Bible does tell us that knowing God intimately starts with the fear of the Lord. We truly have to have this fear of the Lord. Deuteronomy 10.12 says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? Man, I, I love that right there. Because that sums up, really, how our walk should be. And But what I, the one thing I really noticed here, and I want you to take notice, is the fear was first. This is, it says, what does he require of you but to fear the Lord your God? That was the first thing that was said. Fear was first. Then we walk in his ways and to love him. But we need all three. It's not one or the other. Well, I'm just going to overly love Jesus. and not. We need all three. We have to fear him. We have to walk in his ways. And we have to love him. But we have to start with the fear of the Lord. I can tell you my journey didn't start with the fear of the Lord, obviously, because that's why I'm down this road that I'm down, searching and studying and doing all this other stuff. And we'll get into a little bit of that later, but it's because the grace message sometimes has overtaken and we don't talk about these things too much. But we have to understand this word fear because this is how we understand the word and how we define it. And so I'm going to get very elementary right now. And so we have fear as a noun, and it's defined. You can look it up online. It's true because it's online. (laughs) It is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. Does that define the Lord? Doesn't define the God that I serve. Fear is a verb is to be afraid of someone or something as likely to be dangerous, painful, or threatening. Notice those words, dangerous, painful, and threatening. I think we would all agree that's the understandable definition of fear. I do not jump out of helicopters or planes, even with a parachute, because I fear going splat on the ground. I fear that that thing ain't going to work. I do not like heights. I ain't going to do it. Y'all crazies that do that, more power to you. Ain't going to be me. I ain't testing the Lord in that way. But I fear that because I fear that pain. Like, it's probably not death that I probably fear. I'm like, man, I don't want to, like, hit and still be alive. Like, just take me to paradise. Like, I know, I just went dark. But (laughs) I just went dark. But I, but I know, you're all going to like, yeah, that's the definition. But it has to be the foundation of what we understand because this is the agreeable definition that we as a people, we as Americans, understand when we hear the word fear. So when we think and hear terms like fear of the Lord, this is why it's so easy to just push aside because I don't fear the Lord in the way that I understand it by the English language. Does that make sense? But you also got to think about it, too. How often in scriptures, when angels showed up, they would say, do not fear or fear not. Y- y'all, we're like, Lord, I want, I want a personal encounter with you. I don't know about y'all, but every time the spirit of the Lord showed up, an angel showed up, they had to be like, yo, homie, you need to calm down. <laughs> Probably because they were freaking out a little bit. I mean, we, we say we want it, but like when the holies of holies is right in front of you, Even just an angel, they had to tell him, do not fear. Probably because they weren't going to be able to process the message that was coming if they had so much fear going on. Because if I have a lot of fear, I'm thinking about how I get out. You know, that's, unfortunately, the sin in the flesh, it's the survival. It goes into survival mode. That's why people lie, cheat, steal, and things like that. It's because they're trying to survive. And a lot of that comes from fear, from anxieties, and things like that. But the days that the Bible was written, the word had a different meaning. And the meaning was really dependent on the context of what was happening. And so to really truly understand this, and about the Hebrew language, it is very complicated. They will tell you translating from Hebrew is a very complicated process because it could mean many different things. 
depending on how it was written, what was being written about, it really was very, very deep. They are also very emotional, not like emotional like basket case people. And I was thinking about this this morning, and I was thinking about the Hebrew people and how emotional they were. Every time they got upset, they like ripped their clothes and threw dirt in the air. I was like, my kids did that when they were five. But they were very emotional people. And I think this is where the confusion comes in because we understand fear in one way, but as it was written, there was a different understanding and terminology to it. So it really under, to really understand it, I'm going to talk about the Greek and the Hebrew. We're not going to dwell on the Greek, but the Greek word for fear is phobio. And that is to frighten, to be alarmed, to be in awe of. That's different than our term of fear. To revere, afraid, fear, and reverence. Phobio actually shows up in the New Testament 93 times. That's a lot of times. Our word arachnophobia, claustrophobia, comes from this. We have that fear on the back. Does that all make sense? Okay. So let's talk about the Hebrew, because this is really what I want to get to. There is a word year ah, and that is for fear, terror, reverence, dreadful. Notice that reverence is in there. So really, depending on how it's being talked about, and that is in the Bible 45 times. But here's the point I want to make. Yira comes from the wo- root word yar. And yar translates to flowing of the gut. So think about it. When you say, I feel it in my gut, we're saying yar in Hebrew, essentially. Does it, y'all with me? You're about like, shoo, John, this is over. The language of old, they really were describing the feeling that overcame them. We've become so cultured. Our language has become complicated. We got words upon words to describe words. Listen, and we're very intelligent people because we spell kernel the right way. But they were very emotional people. So think about if you were scared, you kind of know that feeling in the gut. Yar. But what if something is so amazing, you stand in awe, could this not cause a flowing in the gut like the word says as well? Could I not have yar as well? Listen, I can tell you there's times that I've probably had more of this, and it's not that because I'm meeting someone famous. You kind of like this feeling comes over you, and you're not afraid of them, but then you start stammering, you start messing up words, and I don't know what to... Because you're just holding it in such a high regard. Listen, that's why context matters when we think about this. So when we think about fear, especially godly fear, there's a reverence, there's an awe, there's this flowing of the gut excitement. And this is why it's so important that we understand these definitions. Because I believe we as a nation... We as a people, we as a church, not just Victory Life Church, but as a church, as a collective body, we have lost sight and understanding of what the fear of the Lord is. Or maybe we never even had it to begin with because it was never preached or talked about. But just like Jim Baker had said, we love Jesus, but we don't fear the Lord. That's cool. We love Jesus. We're about there. But at some point, the fear of the Lord stopped being important. It stopped being a foundational teaching, so it stopped being practiced. We have lost our fear of the Lord, or let me say we've lost our awe of God. And some people are like, no, 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 I love God with all my heart. I really hope what you're hearing me, because that's not what I'm talking about. Love and fear, love and awe are two very different things. They're two different approaches My kids can love me, but that doesn't mean that they're in awe of me. When they were little, my kids saw me as their superhero. I could beat up anybody. They felt safe with their daddy. But at some point, they become teenagers, and familiarity creeps in, and they get a little older. They get a little wiser in their mind. (laughs) And then they start to lean on their own strength to get things done. They don't need daddy anymore. So they still love me, but I'm not 
that superhero that I once was, the awe kind of fades. And I think sometimes we do this to God and we might not even be aware of it. And so instead of raising up to him, we pull our view of him down. And I'm I'm specifically saying it this way because we cannot pull God down. You know, I, I look at it, it's the plumb line. We will never live as perfect and as holy as he is, but it doesn't stop us from trying to hit the standard. But I think we get overwhelmed by that, and so we pull him down and we make a friend of him instead of Lord, King, our Father. We have to keep our awe and our view of him up here, and we will rise up to it. But if we pull it down and we go here and like, me and Jesus, we good. I love Jesus, but I don't fear him. Mm. We have our Father in heaven that we truly love with all our hearts, with all our souls. But we may have lost our awe. We may have lost our reverence of him. But we need to go back to him as our daddy. That superhero in our life, the one that can do anything. Our daddy who helps us through all our troubles picks us up, patches us up when we get scrapes and bruises, kisses the boo-boos. The one that is holy, just, righteous, sinless, without fault or blemish. Our daddy who fought our battle and gave us the victory over the adversary. He sent Jesus. That's how much he loves us. And this is why it's so important that we understand what the fear of the Lord is. Because without it, the other things I'm going to share today, they're just irrelevant. Because more important than understanding what the fear of the Lord is, we must have the fear of the Lord in our lives. In other words, we need to have a reverence and an awe of him that is so overwhelming. Charles Spurgeon said this, the fear of the Lord is the death of every other fear. Like a mighty lion, it chases all other fear before it. See, if our view of God is so big and so grand, nothing else can occupy our minds and our hearts. When we're so preoccupied by the world, we need to go back to that fear of the Lord. Let him occupy that space. And so when I read Charles Spurgeon's um, quote, I thought of Psalm 23, 4. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and staff, they comfort me. See, when we walk with the Lord, when we have a fear of the Lord, when we live this life of reverence and awe for our Father in heaven, we no longer have fear of anything other than him. His fear is clean and enduring forever. This other fear, it gets us to do wacky stuff. And just like a good daddy, he is with us. He comforts us. He protects us. He guides us. He chases away our enemies. If we feel like we're fighting these battles alone, we may need to look at the fear of the Lord in our lives and raise him back up in that awe and reverence. This scripture that I want to share, I want you to highlight in your Bibles. I'm going to Proverbs 1, 7, if you like to write in your Bibles. I'm a weirdo. I write in some and I don't write in others. But Proverbs 1, 7 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And I'm having you highlight this, to underline it, to start, to remember this. Because as you go home and as you study this, as you spend time with the Lord, dwell on this. Because it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. King Solomon and all his wisdom granted by God. And God even said no one would be as wise as him. Ever. Tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I'm pretty sure I want to listen to that. If we don't have this fear, if we don't have this awe by what the scripture says, then what are we? We're the fools that despise knowledge and wisdom. 
I don't want to despise wisdom and instruction. So I want to choose to fear the Lord. And this is why our country, why we today are a little bit lost. We don't operate in knowledge because we don't have any. Because it starts with the fear of the Lord, not our ability to remember scripture. Man, we will honor people that can remember scripture all day long. Reading a few Bible verses doesn't give us this knowledge. That's just an accumulation of information. The word is very clear here. The beginning, not the middle, and not the end, but the beginning of knowledge is having this fear of the Lord. We'll never arrive to having enough knowledge or wisdom of his glory. It's too vast. I love how pastor says it when we go to heaven, our first couple of years, there's going to be like, what, what, what? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah, might be the only two words that we say for a long time as we're getting it. But we have to have this fear of the Lord and we press into our relationship with him, our walk with him, and he begins to reveal things to us. We don't just go to the word and just accumulate information. We're now going to get revelation from God. And that is what true knowledge is, true wisdom. Isaiah 33, 6 says, Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. If you don't have stability in your life, it's probably because there's no wisdom and knowledge in there. And the strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord, is his treasure. We are to fear the Lord, and it is his treasure. He delights in it. When I think of treasure, I'm not thinking about y'all fearing me. We think of treasure like, I want gold, big house, I want this, I want that, I want a boat, I want this. But the Lord is different. His treasure is when his people honor him, when they fear him, when they love him when they glorify him, when they praise him. Truly, I love it. That makes me thankful because I can give him that. (laughs) But having the fear of the Lord, it empowers us to remain under submission to truth. And in doing so, it keeps us on the path of life. Or another way put, we can't just keep trying to do better and be better. There's a better way. And that's starting with the fear of the Lord, putting him first in everything. And so if we start with the fear of the Lord and leaning on him and not our own understandings, man, our life would be so different. Our walk, our journey would be so different. The other reason we may not have the fear of the Lord, and this is a really big point I want to make today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Galatians 2.11. We may not have this holy fear because we replace the fear of the Lord with the fear of man. And so I'm going to pick up here in Galatians 2.11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Paul is writing here that he had to call Peter out for his fear of man. Peter wasn't being straightforward with the truth, and he was living one way with the Jews and another way with the Gentiles. So he was eating, cutting up, doing everything with the Gentiles, but then would act a different way with the Jews. Kind of sound like us today? He wasn't being straightforward. And so this fear of man is truly a real thing. If it snagged up the apostles, don't you think it could snag us up too? Absolutely. And so here's the thing. I don't know about these Jewish men, but Peter could have respected them. Maybe he didn't mean anything by it. Maybe they were influential. Sound like us today? How when we get in a group of people, I may not cuss here, but I cuss over here. 
I do this thing here, but I don't do this thing here. And I love it that Paul called it out. And I think it's a great example of how the fear of man can become greater than the fear of the Lord. Peter, an apostle of Jesus, retreated from what he knew because of those that are around him. But Paul, believed, I believe he feared the Lord enough to have this conversation. But we do the same thing today. Our fear of the fear of man is greater than the fear of the Lord sometimes. We don't tell our coworker about Jesus because we don't want to be that guy. We don't stand our ground on political topics because, well, I'm a Christian and I'm not I'm supposed to be a peacekeeper. Listen, y'all, it's okay to keep the peace, but not at the cost of our convictions. And I also want to say this though, it does not give you a license to rip apart and tear others down. Everything we do and say must be rooted and grounded in love. We do not have to be a jerk to stand on our convictions. But at some point, grace and love, they have to be a part of this. So if I fear the Lord, and this is my conviction, I can still share my conviction with grace and love. A lot of times, too, is separation of church and state. Well, there's separation of church and state. You know, separation of church and state was actually created to keep the government out of churches. And at some point, it flipped around. And now it's the government saying, no, 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 we don't want you in here. No, it was the other way. This country was founded on biblical principles. But at some point, it got twisted. You know why? Because we wanted to keep the peace. Okay, separation of church and state sounds good because we'll keep the peace that way. Y'all, that ain't right. That ain't how it's supposed to be. We have to. And, and, and we can't keep the peace if, if that's fear of man. We can stand on our convictions. We can fulfill the purpose that God has for us. But we need to fear him more than we fear man. And we need to stand on those convictions. And this is what happens. And I'm... I may rough, ruffle some feathers here, but when we have preached grace and love more than the fear of the Lord, I think that's why we kind of got here a little bit. We're supposed to be kumbaya, tender, loving people. We are supposed to be loving people, but we also have convictions that we should stand on and a life that we should live very different from this world. And so if you're a believer, you heard a message of grace and love. I heard a message of grace and love, and then I became saved. We need to continue to preach that, that message, but we also need to preach the fear of the Lord. We need to live a life with the fear of the Lord, but also with grace and love. It's not one or the other, and I don't know why we get extreme pockets. Like, I'm going to be of grace and love, and then I'm going to be this other, like, I'm going to yell at you and scream at you and cram things down your throat. Why can't we do it all? Jesus did. So what do we do with all this? Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What? I'm supposed to work my salvation out with fear and trembling? I, I, I need to make this point, and I need to make it very, very clear. Paul is not saying you need to do this for salvation. He is simply saying you are saved. Now work this new life out with fear and trembling. Now that because we have accepted Jesus as Lord of our life, we are born again, we are made new, work this life out with fear and trembling. Fear of the Lord is absolutely supposed to be a part of our journey today. Not fear and trembling of losing salvation, but fear of the Lord and walking this life out with him. And this is because Paul knows what Proverbs 1, 7 says, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. He's reminding them of that. You need to do this with fear and trembling. Go back to Proverbs because when we have that fear, that's the beginning of knowledge. And so just a couple more points, and I'm going to get you out of here. I know this is a lot, y'all. It is an absolute lot. It was a lot for me. 
I tried to reduce, and the Lord was like, no. I said, okay, I will do what you say. But A.W. Tozer said this, the fear of death and judgment goes out of us as the true fear of God comes in. And that fear has no torment, but is rather a light and easy yoke for the soul, one which rests us instead of exhausting us. Do you feel exhausted? Try the fear of the Lord. Because all that other fear in your life, it's just going to eat you up. It's a heavy burden. And this reminded me of Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who labor are and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, when we have a true fear of the Lord, it's not bondage, it's not change or chains. It is change. But we find rest. It's easy. The burden is light. Authentic holiness is not bondage. It's true freedom. And we do find rest in him. But here's the thing. I think there's a lie that we believe that we think we have to be boring people to truly follow God and obey God. And that's because society has made sin sexy. They make it look like it's sophisticated, like you are, you've graduated, right? And that's all because of these glowing idols that we call our TVs. The best thing that we can do is power down our devices a lot more. Turn those TVs off, turn the phones off, get off social media, stop listening to some of these politicians because they, that culture, they're telling us, oh, well, that's okay. Well, that was back then. We're so much cultured and sophisticated now. We're so much different. Listen, we're not that much different. We just got new technology. The enemy has more ways to get into our household. I love uh, Smith Wigglesworth. He had someone come over to his house. I can't remember who it was. And knocked on the door. He said, you can come in. And he pointed at the newspaper. He said, but that garbage, that trash cannot. He wouldn't even let the paper in his house because of what it was doing to people. He did not even want it in his house. You know, there's some things that you need to purge your house of so we can rise up in the fear of the Lord. And so we go, well, no one was harmed. <clears throat> What's the big deal? But I have to ask you, <clears throat> does it please God or does it please man? Because when we live this life with a fear of the Lord, we live it to please him and to bring honor to him. We start to lose the desire for these other things that bring us and others. We just want to honor him. <clears throat> and when we have this fear of the Lord, we no longer desire sin because of this holy fear. We want what he wants. His will becomes our will. His desires, our desires. We love others as he loves others. <clears throat> if we're critical and cynical, we might need this because our God is not. He looks at that person that is deceived or not in living in the truth. He still loves them. His heart aches for them. But when we have that fear of the Lord, our heart starts to ache for them. We will start to weep for those people because we want them to live in the truth that we do, the freedom that we do. We become in line and in sync with him. <clears throat> I've only scratched the surface, and I've said that already today, but I, I really have to make that point clear because I, I really ask that you guys continue to seek the Lord about this holy fear. <clears throat> I cannot do it justice in 45 minutes or 50 or an hour. Well, it depends on when I get you out of here. <clears throat> but we have to raise our level of awe and our reverence back in our hearts to him. He's not on the level playing field as us. He's our God above, our father that's seated in the throne in heaven. We need to raise our awe, our reverence back to him. And so if you're sitting here today and going, man, that was weighty, <clears throat> it was. <clears throat> but you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to make that change today. Because <clears throat> the moment you declare him as Lord of your life, 
you are made new. You are born again. You are grafted in to him and into heaven. You're part of the family. He is now daddy. You got a brother in Jesus. You get the Holy Spirit, the helper. You get the three-in-one combo deal. No, it's not a combo deal. But Christ will be in you, and you will be in Christ. And the Bible makes it very clear that if we believe in our hearts and we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, we will be saved. <clears throat> and then just like Paul said, then we work that life out with fear and trembling and continue to grow in the knowledge and wisdom that he gives us. But today, make it your day to become made new. Make it your day to have your name written in the book of life. And so if that's you, we're going to have you say this prayer. But church, we say this together. And I, wanna, I really want to make a point. We're, we're pretty standard on this. And there's a very good reason for that. It's because when you go out and you got a coworker or someone on the street, you don't have to fumble for words. You're like, what is that we say every Sunday? And then you can walk them through this. We want to make it as simple, as easy for you, just as much as easy as for the unbeliever to become a believer. Amen? All right, so church, let's pray this. Lord Jesus, <clears throat> come into my life and make me new. <clears throat> and from this day forward, Jesus is my Lord, heaven is my home, and I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> if you just said that for the first time and you are now born again, I, you got to tell somebody. You can't keep a secret you got to tell somebody. We have an information desk out there. Go to it. We want to give you a Bible and a few resources to get you started. We don't want you to just like, well, I'm new. Now what? We, we want you to grow in this. And so we got some things for you. Stop by. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't let fear get you. All right? Walk in the fear of the Lord. But for all of us, let's leave here today with this reverence of God, this awe of him that we've never had before and because I know when we do we're going to grow so much in our relationship with him it will truly change us from the inside out too often we try and change the outside before the inside inside out that's permanent change and then you won't need to tell people about the change they're just going to be like There's something different about you I was like today, someone's like, you got a haircut. I'm like, yeah, it's a little shorter because I'm balding. You know, I'm trying to hide that I'm balding. It's not working well. But that change will be seen by others and be like, what's different about you? Well, let me tell you. His name is Jesus, and he loves you. And we get to share the gospel just by that. But if we live a different life on a Saturday than we do Sunday morning, we'll never get those questions. We'll never get those opportunities. So with that, I love you guys. We thank you. We know there's opportunity waiting out there. So go out there and be light. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to click on the subscribe button. For more information on Victory Life Church, check us out at victorylifeky.com. Thank you so much for listening.